Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Um, let's see if I can do this. Oh, no, I've gone too far. Lovely. Oh, I've got it down here. Fantastic. I was going to say, I haven't got a laptop. Lovely. Uh, do, I need to, do I need to stand here, or can I wander around? If you have a microphone. If I have one. I'm gonna, um, no, I'm going to stand. I'm, I'm going to stand here. Otherwise, I've got too many things and too few hands. My apologies. Um, just, just, just to pick up on a point that Professor Blickstein made this morning. I think, I think a moment of quiet reflection after the activity that we've just um, all taken part in is appropriate. Uh, I thought it was a fascinating activity um, and resonated with a lot of the things that I've been thinking over the first day of this conference. I've been very tempted to ask all of the speakers so far what we, what they, what, and what we as a field mean by interactivity. Um, the task that we had defined an engagement with an exhibit as being, as being spending five seconds there. Um, that, was, that was interesting. Myself and my partner Louise went to, not my partner Louise, but <laughs> she's not my partner. <laughs> I'm going to stop that now. Um, <laughs> um, went to the Mirrors exhibit, um, which, we, which was fascinating. Um, and there's, and, there's, and there's, there's one of those big curvy mirrors that makes you look very fat, even if you're not very fat. Um, and we, we, we were observing a young lady and her mum. Um, and they went to that exhibit. They, they didn't spend five seconds there, so we couldn't count it as an interaction. But they came back to the exhibit four times. The girl, the, the, the girl watched her mum get all fat, and then, and then, and then, and then, they, and then they went off and did, and did something else. And then, and then the girl dragged her mum back, and they got all fat again. And then they went off, and then they came back and did it again. And then they came back and did it again. And they were only spending a few seconds there each time. Um, but the, um, the engagement was characterized, every time the engagement was characterized by laughter. Um, so it was very, very short, the, the engagement with that, with that exhibit. But there was obvious joy going on there. Um, obvious emotional engagement, emotional investment in that exhibit. And it made me think that perhaps interactivity isn't the holy grail, the goal of these, of these kind of exhibits. And that, and that whether it's interactivity or participation or engagement, perhaps that doesn't matter. Perhaps we're just interested in impact, and perhaps that impact is about emotional engagement, some kind of emotional investment between the individual and the exhibit. I thought I thought I thought that was that was an interesting um, an, an interesting reflection, bearing in mind what we heard yesterday um, and and this morning from um, from Professor Blickstein. Um, good. I need to get on with my presentation, otherwise, otherwise I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to run out of time anyway, let's be honest about it. But, um, good. My name's Dan. I work at the Natural History Museum. Um, this, is, this is the Natural History Museum, big Victorian museum. Um, and whatever abuses of education the Victorians were responsible for, they certainly knew how to make an impact. Okay, they knew they 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 knew how to create that ah experience that's so powerful for visitors. This is this is this is our central hall, um, a wonderful piece of a wonderful piece of of of, of cathedral-like architecture, and it's the experience that most of our visitors get as soon as they walk through the door. Um, okay, another lovely photograph of my museum. Um, and, and a definition of learning. Please, please don't take notes. If, you, if, if any of this is interesting to you, I've put my email address on my last slide, and if you email me, I will simply email you the entire presentation with the notes. So don't feel you need to take notes now. Um, that's, our, that's, that's the definition of learning that we adopted back in oh, the early 2000s, perhaps 2002. Um, process of active engagement with experience. I'm going to go on. This is my little bit of the museum. Um, it's called Investigate, and it's the museum's hands-on center, hands-on science center. 
um, though I'd prefer to think of it as a minds-on centre. You do get hands-on in Investigate. We have a large handling collection of real natural history specimens. Um, so we have trays of teeth and bones and claws and eggs and nests and, and, and fossils and minerals and rocks um, that visitors can choose to explore. Um, but it's the process of scientific investigation that we try and encourage visitors to engage with. Um, just, some, just, just some visitor numbers for, um, for, for, for the gallery. We get something like 20,000 booked school groups, booked, booked school children, in, in school children in book groups every year. And, and clearly vastly more families than that. Um, our latest evaluation, um, which, was, which, which, was, which I saw for the first time um, just before getting on the plane uh, to, to come here, showed that 22% of our family visitors are repeat visitors to the centre, um, which, is, which is a figure that personally I feel, I feel, I, I feel very, very proud of, the fact that people are coming back speaks to the quality of the experience. Okay, um, some context and some aims. It's really only the aims that I want to talk about on this slide. And in fact, it's not the aims that I want to talk about, it's what's not the aim of Investigate. Um, we want to allow close examination of real objects. We want to facilitate open-ended invest, I'm reading it off the slide here. We want to facilitate open-ended investigations and we want to provide memorable experiences that can act as reference points for later learning. The thing that's not there is cognitive gain. We, we, we do not set out to teach people science or science facts. I talk about investigate as a learning environment rather than a teaching space. Um, it's a place where we facilitate the visitor's curiosity rather than try and teach them things that we already know. Um, that stems directly from our ethos, which is unashamedly constructivist. The, the, the information that people construct for themselves is more powerful and likely to be, li likely to be better remembered, better internalized than facts that somebody else is telling you. I'm going to go on. Investigate features real objects. Um, these, are, th these are objects from our, from our handling collection. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> That's all I want to say about that, really. Um, we then have a range of tools at the workstations um, for exploring those specimens. Mostly those tools are for weighing, measuring, looking closely. Um, Yes. Good. I want to say something about science process. Um, at the Natural History Museum, as well as being a big public museum, we're also a science research institute. And we have 350, maybe 400 scientists working on site, exploring the natural world through the collections that we've been, collect that we've been building up for the last two, three hundred years. Something like that. The offer that we make to visitors in Investigate is that they can be a scientist for the duration of their visit. We provide the raw materials, the specimens, for their investigations, um, and we provide tools to do that. We then have facilitator staff, who we call science educators, who work face-to-face -face in the gallery with the visitors. They are not teachers. They don't, we don't, we don't let them answer people's questions unless those questions are very, very specific indeed. Um, their job is to encourage visitors through a process of scientific investigation, which I'm going to talk about now. This is, this is the model that we use for structuring interactions in Investigate. Um, as Professor Blickstein said this morning, the ultimate purpose of education is to make citizens more independent, more independent in their own learning. 
if we can if we if we can give them the motivation and the skills to find stuff out for themselves then they don't need us they don't need other people to tell them what to think or what they need to know they can make those decisions for themselves that's a, that's a, that's a, that's for me that's that's the aim of education make people independent um, so we want to move people from the bottom of the arrow through to the top of the arrow. We want to move them from novice learners to expert learners. I've tried with an online package to translate the terms into Polish. I've no idea how successful I've, 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 I've been at this. Um, we've identified three stages in that development, in that in that journey from novice to expert. Um, at the bottom left-hand corner of the arrow that goes up um, is the describe phase. This is where most novice learners are most comfortable. Um, if you're learning something new, then you are most comfortable dealing with the concrete, dealing with, 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 with the reality, with the physical reality of in our cases, in my case, um, a natural history specimen. Um, so, so, so looking at it, using your senses, your sense of touch, your sense of smell, your sense of sight, obviously, um, building descriptions. That might be that might be making drawings. It might be annotating sketches. It might be it might it might be a written description. This is also mirroring the scientific process that our researchers at the Natural History Museum go through. If you're a scientist out in the jungles of Belize and you find something that you've never seen before, you're a complete novice about this object, whatever it is, the first thing that scientists do is describe it. That might be, that might be photography, it might be a written description, it might be sketches, all these things that we encourage our visitors to do in Investigate. Once visitors have become comfortable with the concrete, with the solid object in their hands, we then try to move them on into a reflection phase. That very often involves comparison. It involves looking for similarities and differences. It may be comparing two objects that are in front of you, or perhaps, or perhaps sorting a set of objects into groups, doing a basic classification. Um, or it may be comparing what you have in front of you to a piece of prior knowledge. Um, so that would, that would be our, our, our reflection phase. Again, we'll, we'll work with visitors who are, who, who are in, that, in that zone, in, in that reflection zone, in order to develop their skills around that area before trying to move them on towards the speculate phase, which is at the top of the arrow. In that phase, having, having, ha having described and reflected on their descriptions, um, visitors can then use what they've learnt to create a model that they can test against the rest of reality. They can form hypotheses. Oh, I see that all these things have all got six legs. Perhaps all these things across the whole world have got six legs. That's a hypothesis that we, can then that we can then encourage visitors to test with the available evidence and that we can send them away out into the real world to test elsewhere. Um, good. <sighs> We've done a lot of watching visitors in Investigate and the stuffed fox, the taxidermid fox that we have built into our wall is by far and away the most popular specimen in the space. Everybody strokes the fox, to the extent when we have to change it, perhaps every two years, because all the fur gets worn off it by thousands of people stroking it. We end up with this really quite creepy, kind of brown, leathery fox shape, which is really quite disturbing, it's quite nasty. Um, talking, talking to visitors at the fox, um, Children talk about foxes in stories, in nursery rhymes. Adults talk about foxes that they see around in London. 
Um, we have a large population of wild foxes largely living outside fish and chip shops. Um, for me, that, for that, that leads me to two conclusions. Um, first of all, that visitors are attracted to things that they already have a link with, getting over that novelty. I, in my, in my naivety, back in 2000 when we opened and I became the curator of this space, I thought the most popular specimen might be the stuffed crocodile or the giant python skin or the Galapagos tortoise skeleton. Okay, and I was completely wrong. It's the fox. It's the fox. People are attracted to things that they already know. Perhaps that's, because, perhaps that's because they feel comfortable about them, but it's also because they feel curious about them. The fox is a familiar object, a fami familiar object, a familiar animal to most of our visitors, but in Investigate, they can experience the familiar in an unfamiliar way. Nobody has ever stro stroked a, a live, real fox um, in, in, in London. You simply don't get that close to them. Um, so experiencing familiar things in an unfamiliar way, I, w I, I would offer to you as a conclusion. Um, good. Another of our specimens, this is a sperm whale vertebra. Um, I foolishly didn't put a scale on the photograph. It's about half a meter across. Um, as well as watching the visitors, I also watch our staff in order to give them feedback on how they're interacting with visitors. Um, and I, I want to tell you a story about one of my staff, um, a lady called Rachel, who was working with a young girl who was probably nine or ten, something like that, um, walked, who walked up to Rachel and said, I know what that is. I've seen something like that before. And they, and they entered into a conversation. Um, the girl told Rachel, told my science educator, that she thought that this specimen had been made by insects. Rachel didn't say, yes, you're right, or no, you're wrong. Um, that's, that's, that, that's not the kind of policy that we, that, that we try and pursue. She said, what's your evidence for that? Evidence, that's what scientists need. Scientists need evidence to back up what they say. The girl got a magnifying glass and showed Rachel the, um, the insect's magnified section that I've, that, that, that I've got there and said, can you see all those little holes? I've seen that before in bees' nests. That's where they keep their honey. That's what makes me think that this is made by insects, built by insects. The girl had reached a conclusion with which virtually every scientist on the planet would disagree. But what she had done was she had used appropriate tools to make observations of a piece of primary evidence. She'd compared her observations with her prior knowledge, formed a hypothesis, tested it against the available evidence, and communicated her conclusions to a member of her scientific peer group, in this case, Rachel. That sounds like a piece of research science to me, done by a nine-year-old girl in 10 minutes in Investigate. That's, that's, that's almost an idealized circumstance as far, as far as I'm concerned. It's very rare that we get visitors to move from, from describe, thank, <laughs> thank you, Deanna, um, from describing all the way through to speculating within one visit. Mostly our visitors spend an hour with us, perhaps a little less um, on average. Um, so usually we're working with them within one zone. But every so often you get a student who can move all the way from describe all the way through to speculate. And that makes us and the staff in the space feel great. Um, perhaps that's all I need to say about that. Um, oh, good, yes. Lovely. Um, as well as real specimens, we then have some activities in Investigate. Um, this, is, this, this is some magnetic jigsaw puzzles. Um, we have a replica, it's not a real specimen, a replica skeleton that sits on a little stool. Um, 
and then and then and then jigsaw bone pieces so that people can build the skeleton for themselves inside the human silhouette. Um, on the facing wall, there's another magnetic panel with another jigsaw on it. Um, and when we opened, we had um, a human, a dog, a horse, and a bat. Um, and 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 and. At the time of my story, um, there, was the, there was the human skeleton and a horse skeleton um, up, on the, up on the other wall. The intention of the activity was, was, was really quite, it was, it, it was quite a dry, science-y kind of idea, I'm afraid, when we started off with it. We thought it was about comparative anatomy. We thought that you know, people could learn things about mammalian skeletal structure, that by observing the, the replica human skeleton, they would then be able to build the human jigsaw, and then because a human skeleton is radically the same as a horse skeleton, um, they would then be able to transfer that learning to the horse skeleton and build the horse skeleton, and go away having learnt something about mammalian skeletal structure. Then, the first Harry Potter book came out, and suddenly, the only thing that the children wanted to do was they wanted to mix the human and the horse together to see if they could make a centaur. I'm, I, I'm, I'm assuming here that Harry Potter is as popular in Poland as it, is, as, as it seems to be every, everywhere else. Fantastic. So, a misuse, frankly, of our resources. I think I, think, I, think, I, think, I, think, I, think I will all agree about that. Um, the wonderful thing was then the conversations that the children had having built a centaur. Um, so I was, uh, I was observing one group of teenage girls um, who wanted to know, um, who, 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 who one, said, one, one said to another, it's got two rib cages. Does that mean that it's got two hearts? So what would happen if you shot a centaur in its human heart? Would the human bit die and kind of flop about <laughs> while the horse bit kept running around? Or, 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 or would the whole, or, 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 or would the whole, the, the whole animal die? The misuse of our, of our somewhat, somewhat worthy but dull exhibit brought it to life for the students in a way, in a way that we simply hadn't anticipated. We hadn't, we hadn't thought that was going to happen at all. Um, We've, we've, we've since taken that, and, and, um, that, that learning and applied it to the other skeletons, so now it's standard practice in Investigate to try and get the children to build mythological creatures. If we've got a, if, if we've got a bat and a human, then we'll try and build angels, winged humans. If we've, if we've, if we've got a dog and, uh, and, and, and a bat, we'll try and build griffins, some, some, some kind of, 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 of winged quadruped. Um, so the flexibility to misuse the resources in order to pursue the student's own interests, I think, I think, I think is a crucial point in our success. Thomas, how, how, how am I doing? Yeah, I think, I'm afraid that your time is up. My time is up? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Um, good. Good. Oh, I promised you a slide with my email address on it. There's my email address. D-A-N-I-W. Oh, what have I done? Ah, we're back again. Um, D a n i w at n h m dot a c dot u k. Please email me. I will email you the um, the presentation along with my notes for it, um, so you could take rather longer over it than I've had today. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. Jinkuya. <laughs>